Hello and welcome to another episode of a Brothers Creed podcast where we talk about motivation, experiences, and we explore the world around us. We're the Thomas Brothers, and I'm Jared. And I'm Ethan, and today we're going to talk about an interesting topic. Uh, we're going to talk about, one. well, at one point, the largest empire in the entire world, the British Empire, with uh, some of the most recent happenings uh, with the the leader, the queen of, of England passing away. Uh, we thought it'd be interesting to kind of talk through some of the, the history and the, the, the size and some of the colonizations of the British Empire itself. Yeah, f- yeah, for me, I just was like, first of all, it's like, why do so many people care about the queen passing? And like after researching this episode, I'm like, oh, now I understand why so many, so many people care. Uh, and then I was kind of like, well, the queen doesn't have any power. And I was like, when did that change? When did the kings in, of, of England give up their power to the people? And uh, so we talk about like the history of that. And then we talk about some of these other countries that used to be colonies and how they gained their independence and you know their relationship that's maintained to this day with the British Empire. Yeah. And well, and one thing you said that the queen doesn't have any power, but uh, she ended up transferring... 129 billion dollars to her son tax free whenever she died so i mean that's pretty powerful 129 billion dollars that's <laughs> a lot of money dude yeah yeah so i don't know we'll, we'll get into it we'll kind of talk <laughs> about the history and and uh, there's, there's a lot to come yes so stick with us all right let's do it spartans what is your profession any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king. What I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills that make me a nightmare. If I can change, and you can change, everybody can change! Let us all unite! Let us fight for a new world! A decent world! Okay, so... First thing we want to talk about is I just want to talk about the history of the British Empire. They have such an interesting, you know, going way back. I mean, and and when this when the powers started to change and the power started to go into the hands of the people. So for centuries, essentially the, the English monarchy held a great deal of authority uh, throughout all of their all of their territories, uh, and they could do basically whatever they wanted. The king was uh, descended from you know, his, his royalty. Maybe in some cases, you know, they were say he, they thought he had royal blood uh, or, or descendant of relation to Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and so there's all these claims that they would use to, to claim royalty. And, and it's interesting that uh, over time, these land barons or, uh, basically owners of the of the different land, uh, noble lords were like hey we uh we want some rights here we want uh, some we don't want you just raiding the coffers of our local churches or, or or taxing us unnecessarily and so this all came to a head kind of uh around the tw- in the 1200s and there had been uh during the crusades there had been some concessions uh by <clears throat> uh, king henry the 1st he had agreed not to seize funds from local churches and not to abuse with heavy taxes and other things of that nature. But he kind of ignored that because they needed money for the Crusades and also to pay a ransom for Richard the Lionheart, who had uh, been captured by the French. Uh, and uh, so they had started making some concessions to these land barons, uh, some of which were ignored. But in the year 1215, King John, who was in power, uh, he was kind of facing a, a civil war that was about to erupt because of these land barons saying, hey, either you make a deal with us or, or we don't want to be subject to these changing rules. And so in 1215, uh, King John uh, and the land barons uh, got together and they, and they signed the Magna Carta, which means the Great Charter. Have you ever heard of the Magna Carta, Ethan? Yep. I remember so, learning about it in school. <clears throat> I remember hearing those 
the words Magna Carta, but I didn't realize it was in 1215 uh, AD. It's so long ago. And really, it acts as the basis of common law within uh, the UK. And it was also used as kind of a basis for the U.S. Constitution as well. Just a, a set of rights uh, that should be given to all people. And it also made the king no longer above the law. And so it's pretty cool. Uh, I didn't go into super depth on Magna Carta because this isn't a Magna, this is, whole episode isn't about the Magna Carta. But that was like one of the founding secessions of power from the king to the people. And they consider that as one of their founding documents of the UK. So it's pretty cool that, that it's that old. Um, it's uh, the Magna Carta acknowledged that the monarchy's powers did have limits and crucially established that the crown could not levy taxes without the consent of a council of religious officials and feudal lords. So the feudal lords eventually became what is now known as the parliament. <clears throat> so the parliament uh, powers depend on how much was granted by the monarch. So in some cases, like in King Charles I in the mid-1600s, he governed without a parliament for over a decade, and that actually ended with him being beheaded in 1649. Uh, hmm. The monarchy was actually abolished in, in 1660. Uh, in the revolution of 1688, uh, Parliament was uh, invited William II of Orange, uh, a Protestant, to overthrow the Catholic king, James II, uh, who had been in power since 1685. Uh, and so there's this big war. He was Catholic. They invited this, Parliament invited this uh, Protestant king to come in that I think was Dutch. And the event ultimately changed how England was governed because that Dutch king came in, King James eventually seceded, uh, and he went away and spent the rest of his life in exile. Uh, but this new King William, and I think his wife Mary of Orange, uh, they actually ended up giving Parliament more power over the monarchy, which planted seeds for future, uh, basically the beginnings of political democracy. Uh, William and Mary then as uh, assented uh, to the Bill of Rights, so they wrote the Bill of Rights, which legally required Parliament to be held regularly, uh, granted full freedom of speech in Parliament, and instituted various civil liberties. So this is kind of the beginning of their Bill of Rights, which is another one of their founding documents. And this is in the late 1600s. Uh, the Bill of Rights and the Magna Carta are those two main ones. So over time, the Parliament evolved into basically a true representative government, similar to how the Congress works in the United States. Uh, the monarch uh, retains the power to invite whomever he or she pleases uh, to form a government. Uh, and, but this is a kind of a holdover from the time of the prime minister, uh, when the prime minister was an informal way of referring to the member of the parliament selected by the king or queen to lead the proceedings of Congress. So essentially, whoever the party that's that's in charge uh, of the parliament is the king or queen technically invite them invite the senior member to be the prime minister it's more of just like a uh, a ceremonial thing there was one king who once in the 1800s tried to not invite the member the primary member of the of the ruling party to be the the prime minister and didn't work so uh, it's just kind of a ceremonial thing now. But uh, the King Charles III, who just took over, uh, addressed the British uh, Britain's parliament on September 12th, 2022, for his first time as sovereign. And that's what they're referred to as, as the sovereign. The monarch remains the head of the British state and the highest representative of the United Kingdom on the national and international stage. The head of the British government, however, is the prime minister. So they have different roles. Essentially, now the monarch and the royal family mostly are just head of charitable organizations. Uh, they do, you know, kind of encourage people. Like during COVID, you know, the queen was very encouraging. You know, during World War II, you know, there's a the king was very vocal about uh, 
you know, he would give speeches to the people, encourage them and stuff like that. But essentially, they don't really have much power anymore. All that power of the government is handed over to the, the parliament and the prime minister. Uh, interesting, there's kind of two houses. Uh, there's kind of two. Like in the United States, we have the Congress. We have the House of Representatives. And then we have the House. Then we have Congress, which is like senators. I think that's those are the two, right? This is the Senate. Senate. Yeah, the Senate. Senate. Yeah, the Senate. The Senate and the House make up the Congress. Yeah, so the, over there they have a House of uh, Commons, which is of like common people, and then they have a House of Lords. And the House of Lords is is kind of does have it doesn't have very much power at all uh, anymore, but it's made up of like a bunch of clergymen, uh, some nobles, uh, but it's kind of a a smaller. Uh, a branch that just kind of helps approve laws and uh, and refine them in some sense, but they really don't have that much power. It's mostly the House of Commons, which is more like your your representative from your local t- jurisdiction that goes up there. And there's a lot. There's like I think a, I saw something like six hundred or something like that representatives uh, that are in there. So uh, it's pretty interesting. But that that's kind of how that's the story of how these kings of old. Uh, went from being kings to really changing their power over to these documents like the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights so that it was more dependent on their rights were written down as opposed to being dictated by what the king or queen said. So, yeah, that's interesting. Any questions? No, I, I, I just think it's kind of interesting. And maybe it's a pride thing, but I've always kind of struggled with like, you know, uh, just thinking that because of my, because of my bloodline or because of my, you know, my birthright or what family I'm born into that I'm just like divinely better than other, that other people. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've always, I've, I've just always struggled with that. And so it's just kind of like, I, I don't particularly see the, the benefit other than maybe like, you know, a hurrah hurrah type rally around um you know it's almost it's almost just like a, a i don't want to say a puppet show but yeah they're almost just there for culture well yeah if, I think it, if anything yeah like my wife made a good point the other day that like she's like well this is kind of like their patriotism i guess it's like this is their heritage this is their culture this is their legacy and i guess i'm like I can maybe see that a little bit like, I don't know. Yeah. It's well, better than like, yeah, it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I think, think it's, I think they're, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think they're, uh, I think their patriotism can be in the, their history. I mean, they have such a, and I guess that's, I guess that the royalty is like part of their history, right? Kings and Queens and everything else, which I mean, technically that's part of our history too. Um, but I, I think you know an int- other thing that they interestingly that they can kind of be proud of and and you know I, it's an interesting conversation because we say oh they could be proud of this but other people are like oh this is terrible but you know at what point the British Empire was you know composed of several different types of of uh, countries or associations so they had what they called dominions they had colonies like the 13 colonies in the united states or in the americas Mm -hmm. they had uh, protectorates they had mandates and they had territories and these were all either ruled by or administrated by the united kingdom um in, in, in some sort or fashion and it all started with kind of overseas possessions and trade posts that ended up growing. So England at the time, was, let's say the late 16th century, so this is like the uh, you know early 1700s. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, no, the 16th century would be the 1500s. Yeah, yeah, yeah early 1500s. <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was like, wait a second. Wouldn't that be 1500s? Yeah. Yeah, it's always it's a, yeah, it's always one before. <laughs> yeah. So they they started just massive overseas uh, trading and they established these trading posts 
um, between kind of the late 1600s all the way up until the uh, early 1800s. And it was from these trading posts that they ended up just growing and growing and growing because of the trade that went through them. And the English governed these trading posts because they were kind of extensions of their country. And because they just kept growing and growing and growing, they just had these presence in these other countries that they just almost like absolved some of these other countries and they just became, well, even some of them weren't even countries at that time. They were just like, you know, land masses that had people on them. Well, you think about like if you have a trading post, you want to maintain law and order at that trading post. Then you have security forces there and then you want to set up some kind of infrastructure there. So you're almost like looking out for your interests, but at the same time, you're like building your own city and you're like, well, why don't we just take this thing, dude? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why, you know, why are we, you know, we could control everything. And so at the, at, at its height, the British empire uh, was the largest empire in history, even greater than the Roman empire. Um, and it was, it was the largest empire for over a hundred years. Even greater than uh, like and the it was, Mongolian empire. Yeah. And so, um, and, and maybe specifically, maybe not talking land mass, maybe talking, well, I don't know, I'm going to get into some statistics here. I, I don't know exactly what the Mongolian empire was, um, like the specific numbers, but this one says that oh, for a hundred years, they were the largest, uh, empire in history, uh, and the foremost global power at the time, which makes sense. Right. So, by 1913, the British Empire held um, sway over, or they kind of governed, 412 million people. And this is in 1913. Wow! So that is that was 23 percent of the entire world's population at the time. Yeah, so wow. the British Empire consisted of a quarter of the people on Earth hmm. at one time. And then by 1920, it covered and controlled, as far as land mass goes, 13.7 million square miles, which it is t equates to 24% of the entire Earth's land mass. And that it doesn't so, even include all the trading routes that they basically owned. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And I mean, this is just stuff that they specifically governed. And so... I mean, that's huge. They they had a quarter of the population of the earth and a quarter of the land mass of the earth underneath their jurisdiction and underneath their rule. So that's that's crazy. Yeah. And, you know, like I said earlier, I kind of hinted at some people are like, oh, that's awesome. And other people are like, oh, that's terrible. Those colonizers, you know, they were they were going to these poor countries and just taking advantage of people, which. I'm sure happened to a certain extent, but it's kind of like a uh what absolutely happened in the Americas, right? That's why we were yeah. like, yeah, we're done. And and but but to a certain extent, it's kind of like, you know, the would those countries be the same today if they were never colonized at the at you know at at the first place. Yeah. Um, you know, would would they have had the the advances? Would they have had the um, the democratic format potentially, um, to their own governments, would they have, um, you know, I don't know, would they speak English? Would they, whatever, you know, I, I think that overall potentially, and maybe it's just cause I'm descendant from, you know, if you go far enough back, these people, these colonizers that I think that they, you know, they, they did good things for the, the following generations after. Um, but I kind of want to, and, and, and I'll talk about a couple examples um, uh, of a few of those. So I kind of broke it down into like different time frames. Mm -hmm. So one is kind of like the, the first British empire. And this is kind of like um, during the time frame where I was talking about how it was growing so much. and It was a quarter of the population and land mass of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so this was kind of the, the, the 18th century, um, 1700. So 17, 
oh seven to seventeen, the late seventeen hundreds, seventeen ninety. Um, and this was when uh, Great Britain had uh, they were the kind of the world's dominant colonial power. Um, they were really the most competition they had was with France, who was also kind of in that imperial stage and growing quickly as well. France was also colonizing like crazy. Um, and then uh, this was kind of at the time where you had the, the 13 colonies, uh, you had the, the Americas, you know, 1776 falls within this, which mm -hmm. is uh, related to the Declaration of, of Independence of the, the, the colonies. Um, but at the same time, Great Britain and Portugal and the Netherlands and even the Holy Roman Empire uh, all continued kind of this war that was going on um, in Europe at the time. Hmm. And so during this time period, during this first <coughs> British empire, I'd say. When you say um, even the Holy Roman Empire, the, the Roman Empire wasn't around in the 1700s. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, they they were to a certain extent. I mean, they weren't called the Roman Empire, but they, um, yeah. I think it was the the... I mean, there was still remnants of the, the of Romans. that time period. And I think the Roman Empire did um, extend uh, out f further than than, you know, I guess it would ex expected. Um, Didn't the Roman Empire fall? Um, well, I guess. F but from German Germanic. uh yeah, and I, and, and I think, and, and I'd have to brush up on my history too, but I think kind of the Ottoman Empire came out of the Roman Empire. Um, I think parts of it, yeah. And so, uh, but it was just mass war that was going on at that time as well. And this, the, the British was fighting the colonies, and so during this time period, they, they lost the American colonies. Mm -hmm. um, and so this kind of leads into the second British empire, which is all the way, you know, the uh, late 1700s to the mid 1800s. And um, since the early 1700s, the United States was used as what they called, it was a, a transportation of um, reload. I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this. So, Basically, relocation of convicted criminals. <laughs> yeah. In the early in the early 1700s, basically Britain just sent all of their convicted criminals to the to the American colonies. <laughs> um, and so the American colonies had been kind of a, a a penalty for lots of different offenses in Britain. Um, and several thousand convicts were transported per year um, to the American colonies from Britain. Well, what ended up happening was after the American Revolution, uh, we said, uh-uh, you're not doing that anymore. You're not just going to send us all of your criminals. And so this forced Great Britain to find somewhere else to transport their convicts to. Huh. Uh, <clears throat> so... Um, in 1783, the British government actually turned their eye to Australia. Um, and so they sent several uh, exploratory missions to Australia. Um, and uh, they, they went there and they, they found the, the there was people, indigenous people living there. Um, but they, they found some areas that they thought would be good for this, this transportation of, of convicted criminals mm -hmm. to drop them off there versus in the Americas like they used to do. Um, so it was kind of interesting. 1787, the first shipments of convicts actually set sail for Australia and they arrived in 1788. But the interesting thing about this is that Australia was actually, they didn't fight anybody. The British just landed on the Australian coast and they claimed Australia through proclamation. 
And so they just <laughs> landed on the beach and were like, whoop, planted their flag and said, this is ours. <laughs> um, and well, that's what, says, uh, uh, that's what it was that what a Columbus did already get to the Americas. He's like, this is, you know, I claim this for so-and-so yeah. Spain or whatever. Yeah. And so I was kind of curious, but well, why did they do that? I mean, people didn't put up a fight or what, you know, what, what, what happened there? And it says the indigenous Australians were considered to be too uncivilized to require treaties. <laughs> oh, um, and, the, and so they're just like, ah, oh, these people, I mean, I guess the mentality was they're, they're savages, I guess. We don't need to make treaties with them. We'll just deal with them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And colonialism does have its downsides, of course. Um, and this brought, uh, especially with all these convicts and everybody that they're bringing over from England, um, brought diseases, tons of violence. Uh, to Australia, um, just a, 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 dist- a deliberate destruction of, of the, the land and the culture of the indigenous people uh, was just, it was actually pretty, pretty devastating on how it was, was gone about. And so British uh, continued to transport convicts to um, uh, New South Wales, which was a, a colony in um in Australia. Uh, They just called it New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Also Tasmania was another colony in Western Australia until 1868. Hmm. So for another hundred years, they at, at, you know, a couple thousands uh, of these convicts a year, they, for over a hundred years, they, they transported these convicts to Australia, similarly to what they did in the Americas. Um, so what was kind of interesting is that these Australian colonies actually became super profitable um, because they they these people, you know, m- many people are, are uh, industrious and they actually started exporting wool and gold. And uh, during the Victorian gold rush, it actually made the capital of Australia, Melbourne, it made just for a short amount of time, it was the richest city in the entire world just because of the gold export oh, wow. um, that was coming out of it. Hmm. And so, I mean, it's kind of an accomplishment. I mean, it's kind of cool. All these like criminals and convicts and indigenous people are like coming together to, uh, you know, grow what they, what they have today. So. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> what well, you say indigenous people that you're talking about like the Aborigines people that were, are yeah. in some ways still protected yep. in some areas over there, but. Actually, no. Didn't the Australian government round them up and make them all get vaccinated? I, I have I have no idea. Um, but it was a mixture of it was a mixture of that, and then there was actually a lot of uh, relationships with the, the the people in New Zealand, which is kind of north of Australia, mm-hmm. um, and that's kind of like the the Maori people, um, kind of the Pacific Islander, um, the 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 kind of the Hakka, and all that different kind of stuff. That that's the Maoris. Um, they had uh, some pretty hefty treaties. They actually did do treaties with that those people uh, because I'm guessing you just don't mess with the Maoris. <laughs> those are some. Uh, those you, are some uh, natives you didn't want to mess with, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you can just take over Australia, but not not New Zealand. <laughs> um, so what what actually ended up happening? Just to kind of sum out the story of how Australia eventually. Um, uh, gained its independence was um, the first the first British ships had arrived in 1788 like we talked about with those ships of, of convicts um, and eventually it evolved into t- uh, six self-governing colonies uh, within uh, Australia so it was New South Wales Tasmania South Australia West Australia Victoria and Queensland and uh, the, the, the last British garrison that left Australia, so garrison is kind of like m- military um, fort, was in 1870. And so really the, the governments of these different colonies were so self-sustaining that the British actually, they just kind of backed out. And at the beginning of the, uh, I think it was like 19... 
the early 1900s, um, the the British Parliament actually voted to just transfer all of the power and everything to the six Australian uh, colonies. Hmm. And they, they ratified, the British Parliament ratified in 1900, uh, basically a, a, a document that said, hey, look, okay, we, we no longer rule over Australia. Um, you know, Australia, you're kind of your own sovereign country. All the six Australian co- uh, colonies kind of came together into one federation they call the Australian Commonwealth. Hmm. And that was formed on January 1st, 1901. Um, and so that was kind <clears> of <throat> what happened with Australia. I, I almost, I thought that it was, I actually looked for a lot of, um, if there was any examples of like people that had fought for their independence from from Britain or from England, like, uh, like we did in the Americas. Yeah. Um, and I have one more example of something that's maybe a little bit more similar to that, but, um, that's just kind of the story of Australia that I thought was kind of interesting how they, cause, cause you look at, I mean, even the Australian flag has, what is it? It's the union Jack, right? The, the British flag as a part of it. So, yeah. I mean, it seems to me like there's pretty good relations there still. Well, yeah, the, the Australia is still part of the Commonwealth of uh, of of Great Britain. So yeah. uh, there's like fifty six sovereign nations that are considered Commonwealth nations. Uh, it's like a voluntary association where they still honor like the Queen as like the Royalty, royal head, sovereign leader. Although there's not really technically any like they don't meddle. they don't pay taxes. Yeah, they, they don't, don't pay taxes yeah. to Britain. Or... No, they don't like, and they don't meddle in their affairs. So like, I looked at um, uh, Canada because Canada was another one of these ones that is the same thing. For example, uh, in Canada, uh, in the War of eighteen twelve, like we, the United States actually tried to take part of Canada. We tried to, to, to fight uh, Canada to or the British in Canada to, to take some of that territory as well. And actually, the the British at the time uh, fought back pretty good. In fact, I'm pretty sure that that was when they uh, sent like a convoy, secret convoy up the river and they ended up like burning the White House. Uh, and so we ended up just like, like saying, okay, like peace on here. And then we just drew a line and we said... Uh, at this parallel, uh, I think it's the 49th parallel, uh, we will not, uh, this is the border, essentially. And so, in Canada, there were uh, a couple of different colonies, the Canada, uh, Nova Scotia, and then New Brunswick, which were formed into an actual country, a group called Canada, in 1867. So, as a British dominion they were no longer a colony but kind of like its own country so they could make their own laws and defend themselves um, but ultimately they will still were still within the british empire uh, over time the dominion added more provinces and expanded into a confederation uh, that extended all the way to the uh, from the atlantic to the pacific ocean however it was still under british rule in 1931 england put canada on equal footing with other Commonwealth countries, uh, uh, and so England st- still has the power to amend the Canadian Constitution at that time, but over more time that would erode and erode. It was during like the sixties, I think it was sixty-five, that the Canadians came out with their maple leaf flower, uh, no, leaf, maple leaf flag that everybody knows, and then in nineteen eighty-two, it adopted its own constitution and became completely independent country. Uh, it laid down the future amendment of the Constitution should be prerogative of, of Canada. So no more interfering from Great Britain. Uh, today, the 10 provinces of Canada each have a separate parliament and administration with the lieutenant governor representing the Queen appointed by the governor general and council at the head of the executive. So there are still people in the place of the 
Canadian government, which kind of represent the Queen or the King now, since it's King Charles. But it's mainly just a symbol of their allegiance to the royal family. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, they are their own country. So uh, it's kind of it's pretty interesting. So when I think about all of the Commonwealth countries, there's 56 sovereign states all over the world. I mean, you talk about like Australia, the Bahamas, Belize, Canada, Jamaica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, uh, St. Lucia. There's lots of little islands and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. They're Indian. probably along those trade those trade routes. Yep, exactly. And so a lot of these, these countries still look to the monarch as the king or queen. So that I'm like, wow, well maybe now I understand now I understand like why it was so why some people care about the queen dying? Because heck half the it seems like so many countries around the world actually still look to the queen as being their sovereign. So I didn't know that before. Interesting. Well, you're about to say half the world, but it's actually only a quarter of the world. Well, at one point it was a quarter <laughs> of the world, but uh, now it's just a handful of countries, <laughs> small yeah. islands in the, in the in the Caribbean, and then a couple of big countries. Yeah. So you were going to talk about you know, India, right? <clears throat> yeah, that's really interesting. You know, so I kind of talked about the the British Empire up until the early. 1800s um and then i talked about australia that was kind of throughout the 1800s and then in 1900 they got their they 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 kind of formed their own commonwealth the australian commonwealth as a government um but this last kind of i guess uh, i want to talk a little bit more about the britain's imperial century which is kind of the eight early 1800s 1815 to 1915 so it's like this hundred years of what they what they call I guess their imperial century, and um, during this period, during the eighteen hundreds to the nineteen hundreds, um, Great Britain would add about ten million square miles of territory, and uh, roughly four hundred million people. We kind of talked about the the size already. Uh, but an interesting thing is that during this time period in the early 1800s, um, Great Britain was fighting Napoleon and the French. Mm-hmm. And there was um, uh, there was a whole, <clears throat> a whole lot going on there. And there was a pretty brutal back and forth. But when um, whenever Britain took victory over Napoleon, um, and, and the French at that time in their 1800s, it really kind of left the, I guess, I don't know, maybe they call it a vacuum, but Britain was really the only serious international rival that was just, com- they were completely unchallenged at uh, on the open seas. And so there was nobody else to really uh, challenge them. So that's kind of when they did the majority of this growing um through this uh this imperial century and this this colonization and everything so Mm -hmm. uh great britain kind of adopted this role as almost like a global policeman um which it sounds like the united states nowadays yeah uh, yeah, exactly (laughs) or what 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 used to be um and they just kind of went around and did whatever they wanted and took what they wanted and said no this is how you need to do things and whatever else um but getting to India in the um, uh, India was actually so they, they call this the the history of the British Raj. So the British Raj refers to a period of British rule on the Indian subcontinent between 1858 and 1950, 1947. So from about 1860 to 1950, so almost 100 years, they had this this British Raj, is what it was called, and basically just a period of British rule over India. Um, a system of, of kind of governance, I guess, or, or rule was um, set in place when uh, um, a very important 
company called the East India Company was um, kind of, they were uh, in partnership with, and I'll talk a little about them in a second, but they were in partnership with Britain to kind of control everything from the trading to the government, to everything that was happening in India and the Indies and, and, and everything else that was, was happening in that, that sphere, in that space. Um, so uh, a little bit about the East India Company. Um, so the East India Company was an English, what they called joint stock company that was founded in 1600. Um, it was formed to really kind of trade in the Indian Ocean region, initially with the East Indies, and then it kind of grew into Asia and China in that that whole area. Um, the 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 company itself actually had like an entire army. I mean, they were the, mm -hmm. they were like the I think the largest corporation that ever existed, um, and they came to rule just large areas of India itself, um, exercising military power, uh, ass uh, assuming administrative functions and, and, uh, just the government over the area. Um, and that, um, the, the East India company basically controlled everything until they partnered with the, the, the government of Britain itself um, when they actually ended up saying, okay, well, all of the stuff that the East India company uh, is, is over now it's just falls under British rule. Hmm. And that's kind of when that, when that rule started. So there was a couple Indian revolutions that happened. Uh, one of the first ones was in uh, 1857. There was a, uh, the Indian rebellion of 1857, which was a huge uprising from the Indian people against the British uh, East Indian Company. Mm -hmm. And what happened was it was basically just a rebellion that the, the East India Company, they, they, they weren't slaves, but they controlled so much that they basically took big groups of, uh, of, of the people in India because there was lots of them, and they conscripted a lot of them into their army. Oh, really? And so um, there was, uh, they called them sep sepoys, which were kind of like Indian soldiers that were part of the, the East Indian Company army. Well, on uh, May 10th of 1857, there was a massive mutiny of these sepoys or these uh, Indian soldiers in within the company's army itself. Mm hmm um, and it kind of grew like wildfire and everybody kept, you know, the, the, these Indian soldiers just kept joining on. It was just this mutiny and they took over some different outposts and all this sort of kind of stuff. But the British came in and basically just squashed the entire rebellion with, mm -hmm. with, with prejudice. <laughs> oh God. <clears throat> um, <laughs> and, uh, so it, they, they kind of squashed that one, but then there was a kind of a second Indian rebellion uh, in 1942. Uh, this one was kind of towards the end of the British reign in India. And the Indian National Army uh, had kind of formed at this point. Uh, it was a, an armed force formed of all Indian uh uh, collaborators, uh, Indian uh, soldiers, as well as uh, Imperial Japanese who were actually on the Indian side and in getting um, the, uh, the British out of India. Really? And I didn't really know this, but the Japanese and the Indians, they actually kind of uh, worked together and this is 1942 so this is during world war ii um hmm. they kind of banded together to fight against the british to gain the their indian uh independence oh really? and so 
Yeah, and so they fought alongside these Japanese soldiers. Um, Even well through and, World uh, War II? Yeah, I, I mean, let's say it says that they fought in later uh, in later campaigns in Southeast Asia theater in World War II. Um, so I didn't know that. I, I, I guess I had just kind of figured that they, you know, I guess the British just were like, ah, oh, we're, we're kind of done with you guys and you can have your own country. But so they kind of fought against that and, and it kind of got to a point to where the British were, they were just kind of like, look, you guys are too much hassle. We don't want to deal with this anymore. The East India company at that point in the, the you know, the 1900s has just kind of dissolved. There was nothing there. Um, trading had changed so much. There was, you know, there was airplanes now and there was just all these different technology and advances and everything. There was other superpowers in the world that were, that were fighting, that, that, that British were fighting against or that they had to contend with. Um, and, uh, eventually they ended up kind of breaking India up into two different parts and there was kind of a Pakistan part and an Indian part. And then, there was like some some countries. It kind of actually formed some dissension within the the country itself, or the the whole the whole thing itself, um, and it caused quite a bit of confusion. And then uh, you know eventually things kind of settled down. They they you know, formulated a, a large government and, and came together. Um, so I guess isn't that, that where, story thought, is isn't that where? But I didn't like Gandhi come in. Isn't that where he like did this like? rebellion against the british government that was like a non-violent rebellion yeah i think he, that was kind of part of uh i guess part of the the rebellion and everything else um i'm not exactly sure i think I've, i at think, what point that played into yeah i think that that was part of like the post-war uh uh post World War Two is that Gandhi was there and they would like do kind of like a civil disobedience type of a thing, but it was like a nonviolent um protest against the British government. And then like it, it ended up to where they're all like, okay, this is like this is ridiculous. Yeah. We these people well, don't I think want to it, I think it had something to do with I think it was kind of like yeah, it was around that that World War Two area. I think it was actually before World War Two. But um, I think he was protesting uh, against kind of some of the, the, I think, the British laws that they had put into place. Um, and whether it was taxation or, um, I don't know, maybe you know, trading laws or something like that. And he was kind of that passive uh, protest type of, of person. Oh, it looks like uh, he, maybe maybe we should do an episode on him. Yeah, it looks like he was. It was like in the 1930s, and it was a pro a defiant march against the British monopoly on salt. Uh, hmm. So he did it civil disobedient and like civil disobedience, like I had mentioned. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Because the the British the Britain's Salt Act prohibited Indians from collecting or selling salt, which is one of the staples of the Indian diet. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. So has has the British Empire been a positive influence or a negative influence on the history of the world? Um, I don't know. I, think, I would I, say I, I, you, maybe you want to go ahead with that answer. I, I think uh, both. I, I think it's been yeah. both. Uh, in some cases, like, you know, some of the things that have come out of the British Empire uh, have been great countries like uh, America. Like we were able to fight against them and, and, and defeat them obviously, but America has become such an emergent, uh, superpower of the whole world that now we are what the British empire used to be in the 1800s, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, you know, so there's an argument to be made that the U S is declining in that now and that there's going to be China is probably going to emerge as the next superpower. Or uh, something like that, but uh, yeah, I, I think that you know we we've talked about several rebellions against the British. You know, I, I, in the one episode we did, I talked about the Zulu tribe uh, yep. that uh, fought against the British, and most of those fights ended up getting absolutely squashed because the British knew that you know rebellion was a 
what could happen and it and it likely would happen and so they knew how to squash it but i think in many cases uh th- they were there wasn't just such a united force uh, against the british like there like there was with uh the united states um, but even at yeah. times with the united states it was pretty fishy i mean i i read that book 1776 and there's some times in there when people were just like oh, okay I'm done with the summer war. I don't want to be here for the winter. And they just all went home. <laughs> and Washington's like, no, please stay. And they're just like, tons of people just went home, you know? So Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think it I think it kind of maybe depends on who you talk to, you know? I think that there are certain people that feel like it's been beneficial, um, you know? And, and, and one thing I will say, I was, I was listening to this thing the other day and was talking about how uh, – Britain was actually one of the first countries in the entire world to uh, abolish slavery, um, which was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I guess they maybe saw from from early on the the downfalls and the the, the terrible thing that it was, um, and they actually fought against it. Uh, they fought against the tribe that uh, was. In Africa, that was yeah, selling they, all they, of those. Yep, yep. They fought. They fought against the African countries that would round up all of the Africans and put them in cages on the beaches and have all of the the slave ships come and they would sell the the other tribes that they had captured um, to you know other countries. Yeah. Um, and so it's just really interesting the history there. Yeah. Well, I, I think that yeah, you know, in some ways. You know, you have like as I mentioned earlier, the Magna Carta was such an important document of rights, uh, and I think in some ways that culture permeated many of these different countries, uh, which now are very prosperous countries in many in many situations. Uh, I think in all of India is a, a growing world superpower. Canada is a, a first world country. Uh, so is Australia and New Zealand. I mean. Uh, these are all uh, now. I think that if you talk about French colonialism, uh, that's a little bit different because, uh, yeah, that's like I think that's a little bit of a different beast uh, because they still are like tapping some of these countries that they are in their kind of commonwealth for money, uh, and, and they're still under their rule. So uh, that's a whole different episode. Interesting. Though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. We should do a, an episode on Napoleon, an episode on, on maybe French colonization, an episode on Gandhi. Make sure to write all these down. Yeah, we talked about. Uh, I talked. I did that one episode about when Napoleon's march to uh, oh, Russia. Yeah. Now it was like the that's true. Most failed military campaign. And he basically went all the way back with his tail between his legs. With yeah, no army. Like a, he left with like a million men. Yeah. And he came back with like ten thousand or something like that. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully, uh, for all of our listeners out there, hopefully this was informative and maybe at the least entertaining. Um, now you know why. Thank so you for people, listening. Yes. <laughs> now you know why so many people care about the Queen. So, uh, thanks yeah. for listening. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, always be be curious, be interested, and always be uh, developing becoming more motivated and exploring new things. And let's build that creed together. Let's do it. 